Linda Kiefer and Linda Green. I need to pray for both of them. Uh, Sister Jeanette. Okay. <coughs> Amen. Pray for our upcoming convention in the next two weeks. Okay. Yes. Amen. And yes. Amen. Amen. Anybody else have a prayer request? All righty. Let's go to the Lord in prayer and let's pray for the service tonight. Uh, I know. A lot of times when things is going on, we've got a big work day coming up tomorrow and a lot of stuff going on, but uh, we need to get our minds on the Lord for sure. Uh, and I, I know he understands, you know, that work does go on and everything, but uh, he desires our praise and our worship, and he, he desires for us to be wholehearted toward him too. Uh, so let's go to the Lord in prayer. Everybody just pray in your own way and pray for these needs. Father, we're grateful tonight for your love, your mercy. We come to you, Lord, with thanksgiving. Come into your courts, God, with praise. Thanking you, Lord, for the goodness that you've uh, showed on our lives. Thank you for your grace and your mercy. Thank you, Lord, for your safety today. Lord, we just thank you and look to you, God, for help, uh, even in this service tonight, Lord, that your spirit might be poured out upon your people, that we might experience, God, your touch. I pray for healing for the ones that need healing, God, and I pray, Lord, for salvation for the folks, Lord, that's connected with our church that needs to be saved. And if anyone even here tonight, God, that is in need of getting things straight with you, I pray, Lord, that you would help them that they might uh, get honest with you and, Lord, that they might be ready because we don't know, we don't know what tomorrow holds, if there will even be a tomorrow. And, Lord, tonight we want to have our minds and uh, our hearts focused on you. I just pray, Lord, for each of the needs that's been mentioned, God, that you'd have your way in each life. I pray for uh, the uh, convention that Brother Swartz had mentioned that they're going to be going to. I pray, God, for safety for them, that you would keep them safe, and, Lord, that your anointing might be upon the convention and upon their lives, Lord, as they're going to be a blessing. They're going, God, to give of themselves to be a blessing to others. And I pray, Lord, that you'd make that come to pass. I pray, Lord, for uh, uh, Tommy, uh, Tammy's husband, God, that I don't know whether he's had surgery yet or not, but I know it's a, a very uh, touch-and-go situation with the heart surgery that he's encountering. I just pray, Lord, for your hand to be up on him and you to help him. I pray, Lord, for this service tonight, that you'd have your way in it. God, that you'd anoint in a special way. I pray for uh, Vanessa. God, I pray that you'd help her and and uh, Alyssa, God, I just pray you'd touch both of them and that you'd move in their lives, that you'd help them, God. Help them most of all that they might get close to you, that your will, Lord, be done, that you be the one that can fight their battles. You be the one, God, that can intervene for them. I pray, Lord, for uh, every need, spoken and unspoken, in the service tonight. Have your way in our hearts and our lives, God, and we'll give you praise. We do love you, and Lord, we thank you for all your blessings. We just praise you tonight, Lord. We thank you for the answer, God, in these prayers. We thank you that there will be an answer to come. Lord, an answer to come forth. I just praise you and love you tonight. Thank you, Jesus. Could you just lift your hands and tell him you love him and thank him? Lord, we do worship you. We worship and we praise you, Lord. We magnify your name. You're worthy of all praise, glory, and honor. And Lord, tonight we just have your way in our lives. We praise you and love you tonight. 
in Jesus' name. Oh, yes, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Remain standing. And I just say to you, church, that there needs to be more prayer. It needs to be that we spend more time with the Lord. And uh, if you have trouble, if you have trouble uh, being to where you can pray, uh, write out a list of people to pray for and things to pray about. Be to where you stop and look at your list and say, Lord, I want to bring this up. Uh, I, I tell you what, we ought to be a people that pray. Amen. Amen. Uh, we have a song. It is? Oh, okay. <laughs> um, I'm gonna be, we're going to be singing Nothing But the Blood of Jesus. Um, but if it's not up there, it's 369, page 369 in the hymnal. Sorry, I probably should have given you a heads up, Caleb. Perfect. What can wash away my sins? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again nothing but the blood of jesus oh precious is the flow that makes me white as snow no other fount i know nothing but the blood of jesus for my part and this i see nothing but the blood of jesus for my cleansing this i plea nothing but the blood of jesus Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other fount I know, nothing but the blood of Jesus. I not sin atone nothing but the blood of Jesus not of good that I have done nothing but the blood of Jesus oh precious is the flow that makes me white as snow no other fount I know nothing but the blood of Jesus what can wash away my sin nothing but the blood of Jesus and what can make me whole again nothing but the blood of Jesus and oh precious is the flow that makes me white as snow
seated, all except the one that's going to testify. Who was that? Without me calling the name, you want to get up and testify, says Thomas? Amen. 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 Anybody else want to testify? Yes, amen. 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 Anybody else? Oh, uh, Brother Bryce, would you go upstairs and turn the fans on? Don't turn them full throttle, but turn them on so these folks that's fanning uh, can have a little relief. Uh, anybody else want to testify? All right, Brother Braden does. Said, I love the Lord and I'm thankful that I'm going to heaven. Amen. Boy, that's, that's worth it all right there. Amen. I, I'm thankful tonight that we still have a church to where you can testify. Amen. Amen. It's not a government-run church, uh, but it's a Christ-run church. And the liberty that we have. Turn the other on too, Bryce, if you would. We've got folks fanning on this other side too. I think the heat's up a little bit higher. Uh, these guys have been working all day. Maybe they've heated it up with all this work they've been doing. <clears throat> I appreciate them for sure. Amen. At this time, I'm going to receive the evening offer and give you opportunity to give. And I'm sure that you you have made provision to give. I hope you have. It's a privilege to be able to give. Amen? Amen. Amen. Pray, uh, if you would, Brother Wells, over the offering tonight. Well, we honor and praise you, Lord Jesus. Well, we honor and praise you, Lord, in every, every way possible, Lord, but especially, Lord, we like to give honor and praise to you who are tithes offering and alms. So let's bless these tithes offering and alms as we give unto you, Lord. We receive them unto you in joy and gladness. Lord, all yes, Lord. Us. Amen. 
Mr. Schwartz, come on to the platform if you would. couple announcements. Thank you for your giving, first of all, though, uh, and being faithful with your giving. Uh, we have the work day scheduled for tomorrow, and everybody that can come and work, we'd appreciate you coming. And then secondly, uh, encourage you to make plans for the revival. Uh, we believe in the Lord to do a mighty work in this revival. Amen. And uh, encourage you to make plans to be at all the services and you have to make commitments for those things to happen because the devil will have you lined up with things that need to take place in your life to keep you from coming but I want to encourage you to do that and then thirdly I wanted to mention that we got uh, a senior fellowship uh, scheduled for May the 4th I believe no May the 6th at 1 p.m. so uh, a senior fellowship here at the church and uh, I'll be talking some more about it uh, want you to bring the uh, the vegetables and the, the bread and the dessert and I'm gonna buy the, the meat this time so but I, I need to know exactly who's coming though so I'll know how many chicken legs to buy or chicken wings Yes, we, this coming Sunday we have the Riverdale Choir, and uh, I, I would highly encourage you, if you know of any, any children, because this is going to be a high school choir, uh, and they, they do a tremendous job. If you know any kids at all that you could get to come, uh, it would be an ideal time for them to be to where that they can see there's a lot of young people that serve in God. It would encourage their faith. For them to be where that they'd want to be involved in, in serving the Lord too. So make plans for that. Is any other announcement we missing? Okay. <clears throat> At this time, Sister Schwartz is going to sing a special for us. Thank you, Sister Schwartz. With short notice. It's always a joy to be able to be called upon to worship the Lord, and that's why we're here tonight. And I just thank the Lord because He is my hope and my strength and my my fortress and um, in this world that gets crazy sometimes and we don't exactly know what's going on, um, we always know that he's there and he's our hope and I'm gonna try to sing tonight all my hope.
the song. Amen. At this time, Brother Gary's going to come preach for us. Amen. Well, it's good to be in the house of the Lord tonight, and I'm glad to be here with you. I uh, love getting together with God's people. We're going to spend eternity together. Might as well get used to one another now, right? Amen. Um, first of all, I want to say I appreciate uh, Brother Eddie and Bryce and Braden for putting our flooring out here in the vestibule. Uh, it's going to, going to give a, a different look, upgrade. Thank you all very much for that. Um, and the reason it was hot in here is because they had to put the glue down and the glue had to dry and... Uh, before it's activated with the, the flooring on it. So they had to turn the heat up and kind of bake that, that glue for a little while. But hopefully these fans will get you uh, kind of somewhat comfortable again, a little breeze blowing around. Um, I hope and pray that, as Brother Thomas said, that we can put ourselves to this uh, service tonight I know that I have had an extremely busy week. I'm very tired in body. Um, and if I did what my flesh wanted to do tonight, I'd be in the recliner probably snoring right now. <laughs> but it was the time allotted to come together with God's people. And um, I thank God for committed people. Thank you for being here tonight. If you have your Bibles, I'd like you to turn with me to Proverbs chapter 20. And we'll just read one verse. It's going to be a lot of allusions to verses tonight. I'll, I'll be making reference to several verses. But stand if you would in verse 18, Proverbs 20, verse 18. The Bible says, Every purpose is established by counsel. And with good advice, make war. I just want that to soak in. Every purpose is established by counsel. The Bible says, God said, let us make man. There was counsel even in the creation. Amen? Every purpose is established by counsel. And then the Bible tells us that in the multitude of counsel, there's safety. But we all recognize and understand tonight that not all counsel is good counsel. There is a lot of examples of bad counsel in the Bible. How many of y'all have ever got some bad counsel? Raise your hand if you've ever got some bad counsel. I have. Tonight, if the Lord will help me, I want to preach to you on just the thought of discerning good or bad counsel. Let's pray. Lord, please make me a blessing tonight, and I pray that it would help your people that we would leave here uh, having been instructed, challenged, and directed to do your will. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. I, um, I think the reason for my being led in this direction is multifaceted. Sometimes um, when a preacher or a Christian or anyone that feels that they have a message to deliver, it can come from several different places, but one thing that I believe is, is kind of consistent when you're talking about giving a message or advice or counsel you, you look around and you see what, what's going on. And something begins to stir in your spirit. 
in response to what you're witnessing. That's the reason the Bible said many times when Jesus, seeing the multitude, was moved with compassion. Seeing what was in the hearts of the Pharisees, Jesus was compelled to speak. And so I would, I would say in all honesty tonight, I believe that why this message has come forth is because of what I'm witnessing around us. And what I seem to be witnessing is a serious lack of discernment. There is a blindness that the God of this world has put on people. And it is becoming so increasingly distorted. The Bible says in the last days it will get so bad that they will kill you and they'll think they're doing the will of God. Right and wrong get so turned upside down that you don't know what you're looking at. It's become that way with uh, transgender. You don't know what you're looking at a lot of times now. And um, it, it, it's become that way with ethics, morals. I heard just this week in Chicago, Walmart pulled out and shut down, I believe it was, it, uh, was it a third or half of all their stores in Chicago. Because theft was so bad that they could not keep the stores propped up. Whole Foods, same thing. We are living in some perilous, perilous times. And uh, I, I'm, I'm truly honest with you. I don't know how anyone with any discernment could look at the news and not just be 100% skeptical. I don't even know why people would watch the news anymore. It's, it's, it's agenda driven. It's narrative pushing. It's ignoring certain things to push advance, advance other things. And, and it's an indoctrination tool. I, I, I don't know why people would want to go to uh, university and get uh, degrees. When, when it's, it's indoctrination centers and, and you raise these kids to believe in God and then you send them off uh, for, for their faith to be a shot at and made fun of and, and denigrated on every side. And, uh, and, and you might say, well, Brother Gary, uh, you're against education. Uh, the furthest thing from the truth. You, you, don't have to, you don't have to go to the devil's uh, convention in order to become successful in this life. You don't have to subject yourself to, to, to the thinking of this and, and the ideologies of this world in order to shine as a, as, a, as a person, as an individual. So, all of that having been said, I think that the reason for this message is because I want to, I want to help you. And I want God to help us all, myself included, so that we can discern good from bad counsel and advice. There's three things that I think are necessary in order to be able to come to this discernment of whether this is good or bad advice. The first one is this. If we're going to, to know what is good or bad, we must discern the motive of the one giving the advice. The Bible says there is a way that seemeth right, but the end there are the ways of death. There is a lot of things about a lot. Well, just take politicians, for instance. They go to extreme lengths to hide certain things of their character and accentuate other things depending upon the audience that they're trying to reach. Right? I listened to a, 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 a mayor um, candidate today that uh, wanted to bring up that he was, he, he, he was a pastor. He was a business owner. And he was qualified to be a mayor because of this, but he was liberal in his ideology. 
But he know he knew he was speaking to a predominantly Christian audience. So he accentuated his pastoral and ministerial, ministerial experience. Because he knew that that would give him credence and credibility with certain ones. The Bible says that Satan appears as an angel of light. So we must know and discern the motive of why people are instructing and advising you in a way. And I know this is uh, very, very simple, but I just want to make some observations. In Genesis 3 and 1, Now the serpent was more subtile than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said. The first thing that the devil wants to do is make you question the Word of God. Question the Word of God. And it sounds so good on the surface. Your faith needs to be tested. Your faith needs to be able to be shot at. And your faith needs to be strong. And I would say that God is not intimidated by any question. God is not intimidated by any accusation. God is not intimidated by any assumption that the devil would make or propagate against him. However... Paul addressed this in the New Testament. When these ladies got together and they just wanted to talk about genealogies. He said, it ain't good. It's making some people shipwreck. It has no profitability to that line of questioning. Eve, by entertaining the thought of this line of questioning, what hath, did God really say that? Hath God said She opened the door for her faith to be led astray. So I would say, you can let the world say whatever they want to. And that's fine. But one one tool in your arsenal of becoming to discernment is do not go down the rabbit hole of unnecessary questioning against God. Amen. The older I've got, the more intrigued I've got, the more debates I listen to, the more Christian versus atheist things, I, uh, just because my faith has been established. I would have never want to expose my child to those things if they were not established in their faith. Amen. Eve was susceptible because she entertained the question, did God really say that? Did God really say that? The question itself was not where the sin came in. But the entertaining the doubt of whether God really did say it was where the sin door was opened. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden. One word, every God didn't say you couldn't eat of every tree. He just said you couldn't eat of one tree. The woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the tree of the garden, the trees of the garden. That was the second thing that was her demise. She began to conversate with the devil. Amen? Uh, don't, don't, don't talk to the devil. Don't, don't entertain the devil's questioning. Amen. I like what that one guy said. He said, don't let the devil ride. Don't let the devil ride because if you let him ride, he'll want to drive. Amen. Amen. Uh, The best way to have a conversation with the devil is just, or if you're going to talk at all, do like Jesus did. Amen. Speak the word to him. Amen. Amen. Well, and then in verse 3, he said, But of the fruit of the tree, uh, 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 which is in the midst of the garden, God hath said, Ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. And the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die. First, it was a question, did God say? And then it was a misquotation, God didn't say that. And God lied. 
For God doth know that in the day that ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. Now this made a false assumption that they didn't know good from evil. You don't have to know everything about evil to know that evil is evil. You don't have to kill somebody to know that, that murder is bad. You don't have to get on drugs to know that drugs is bad. Amen. You do not have to have an experiential knowledge that wickedness is wicked. You can reasonably deduct by the evidence of nature, good is good and evil is evil. Amen. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was pleasant to the eyes and the tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof and did eat and gave also unto her husband with her and he did eat. Now, the first point of the message is this. You need to discern what the motive is of the person giving the advice. Anybody that gives you advice that's contrary to what God has said, they have wrong motives. They have wrong motives. What was Satan's motive? To kill, steal, and to destroy. His desire for man is to ruin lives. His desire for man is to break hearts, create sadness, cause tears and anguish and anxiety and doubt and fear. Satan's motive is not good. Now, let's be honest. Sometimes it's hard to discern motives, isn't it? Because people can cloak their counsel in such good terms like, you deserve a break today. Come to the mountains, the mountains of bush, light. They they can hide their motive with their message. It's about packaging. You guys been hearing all this stuff about the bush, bush beer. Is it bush beer? Is it bush beer that's having the problems right now? They put the picture of the transgender. Bud. Is it Bud? Bud Light? Bud Light. Put a picture of a trans uh, person on, on the thing, and all the beer drinkers are up in arms about it. But they won't be when they drink a few more beers. I let's come back to what, what, what my motive is in preaching this. My motive is I don't want you to be led astray. I don't want you to wind up a statistic. I don't want you to entertain the devil and become his fodder. I don't want you to have to visit the divorce courts. I don't want you to have to visit the rehab center. I don't want you to have to visit the psychologist because of depression. Or get on some sort of medication. I don't want you to have to go down the road of heartache and pain and discouragement and trouble. The devil has an agenda. Let me just say this. Most everyone who gives you advice has some reason for giving it. And either it's self-serving in some roundabout way or it's pure in its nature. And if you're going to take good advice, you need to discern the motive of the person giving you the advice. And one of the things in discerning motive in someone giving you advice, you ask yourself, what do this person have to gain by telling me this? Do they want a business deal from me? Do they want some sort of power, influence, or control over me? What is the motive 
for this advice being given to me. Look at their lives in other areas and see what type of person. What is their relationships like? Are they a truly genuine person? Or, or would other people say that they're a shyster? Go ahead. The reason I'm preaching this is because there's a serious lack of discernment today. People are sitting here in church and they're listening to uh, ungodly counsel over the radio. They're choosing mentors in their lives and they're quoting people. So-and-so said this and so-and-so said that. And, 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 and they're not godly people. And I just want to say, hold up. Stop a minute. Wait and look into what you're listening to. Because... It's very, very, very easy to get sucked into a false belief. Could I just tell you this? Every heresy started out of the truth. It wouldn't be a heresy if it had not gone astray. That's the very term, that's the meaning. And you might say, well, how in the world did we get all these other religions? How did, we get, how did we come to all this? Because somebody somewhere with ulterior motives took some scripture or took some truth and twisted it. Not too much at the beginning. Just enough to get it off course. A following came because somebody had itching ears. Because they wanted to hear it that way. And then, lo and behold, now you're full-blown believing a lie. Amen. The first step in being able to know whether it's good or bad counsel is to discern the motive of the one giving it. Secondly... Determine the philosophy or mindset, belief system of the one giving advice. Now, obviously, I hope and pray you understand here tonight, I'm not saying that everyone that gives you advice on everything has to be a Christian. If you got a mechanic and you need a mechanic and, and he don't believe in Christian and in, in Christ, but he knows cars, you could take his advice on cars. Right? right. But I would say this. If you could find a real Christian mechanic, you'd do yourself a favor if he's competent, if he's a competent uh, mechanic, you'd do yourself a favor because you'd have, you'd have some assumptions built in that he's going to be honest and ethical and he's going to be trying to tell the truth. Amen? If you could find yourself a good, wholesome uh, Christian doctor, it, it'd be better than having one that, that wasn't a Christian. I know when my dad fell and, and messed his neck up and he came and he found Dr. Hefty. Dr. Hefty, was a, he was an honest, good uh, chiropractor. I know when you, when you went up. Yeah, it was, I know when it was. It was when you fell on the ice up there at the marriage retreat at Bear Trap uh, Resort or whatever it was. And uh, dad was in so much pain. And, but Dr. Hefty, Heft, is it Hefty? Dr. Hefty uh, convinced my dad to not go under the knife and he could, he could help him, and he did. Uh, and thank God dad listened to him. Dad was in so much pain, he was, he was ready to give up. He was ready to say, I, I'm ready to have surgery. Just, let's, just, let's just get in there and get this thing cut and dealt with. Block this nerve. And Dr. Hefty said, Pastor, please don't do that. Give me, give me just a little more time. I know I can help you. And he did, and thank God that dad took that advice. Amen. So, so I, you got to understand what I'm saying. I, I'm not saying that, that uh, I'm, but I'm talking about life advice. I'm talking about life decisions. I'm talking about direction. If, if someone's going to tell you uh, something and they're going to advise you on, on what, uh, what it means to be a, a godly spouse or what uh, the role of a wife or a husband or, or what the role of a parent or what, the role of, uh, what our role is in finances, anything that the Bible speaks about, in any regard, you need to be able to determine the overall philosophy and mindset, worldview, 
of the person giving the advice. And let me, let me, let me dive in just a little bit here. We have such a mixed bag today of people claiming Christianity, holding to certain Christian values while totally ignoring others. Just because someone says they're a Christian and they may be very strong and staunch in some of their Christian views and they might have had the world to influence them so strongly in other areas that their, their counsel is a mixed bag. For instance, take the issue of divorce. Did you know that the Bible has something to say about divorce? The Bible has something to say about divorce. And I say to every married couple here tonight, if you are married, it is God's will for you to stay married to the one you're married to. But what happens is, People that have gone through divorce, they seek out others that have gone through divorce that would give them counsel that it was okay. And therefore, now we're off in a road and are running down a path that is not good. So if you got trouble in your marriage, don't seek out someone that's on their third or fourth marriage. Amen? And you might think to yourself, well, they would be willing to give the best advice because they've got the most experience dealing with difficult people. They they came to the wrong conclusion dealing with difficult people. And some of them did it before they were saved. We don't don't throw stones. That, That is not what this is about. I'm just saying that our decisions in life, uh, I forget who it was that said a hundred years ago, a man's morality will dictate his theology. A man's morality will dictate his theology. If you get a guy that's a, an adulterer, he won't ever preach that adultery is wrong. If you get, a, if you get, if you get somebody that's, that, that they're drinking, you won't, hear, you won't hear sermons about drinking. If you get someone that's lying, you won't hear sermons against lying. And, and the reason is, is because if we're not striving to adhere to the Word of God in all areas and all facets, then, then the, the mindset that we have, we develop this mindset and it's tainted. And, 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 and well, the Bible says it like this in Jeremiah chapter 10 and verse 1. Hear ye this word which the Lord speaketh unto you, O house of Israel. Thus saith the Lord, learn not the way of the heathen and be not dismayed at his at the sign of the heavens for the heavens are dismayed at them hey listen listen there's a lot of things we don't need to learn and there's a lot that we don't need to listen to we don't need to fill our minds with the latest songs of the world, the latest movies of the world, the latest uh, ravings of the world. Did, 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 I, I, I'm talking to you how we've lost our discernment. We've lost our discernment because we've filled our minds with the ways of the world. The, the, it used to be in Pentecostal ranks especially that it was preached against about the fashions of the world. Amen. Uh, it, it was preached against about uh, the, the look of the world. It was preached against about the activities of the world. And all of that stemmed from the scripture where it says, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. For if any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. And we derive that teaching from the, the scripture where God said, Come out from among them and be ye separate, saith the Lord. And touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you, and I will be your father. Yes. And we were saying, if God said that his love's not going to be in us if we love this world, we don't want to love this world. 
And therefore, we had a heightened sense of awareness of everything that was worldly. The world's philosophy, the world's look, the world's agenda, the world's order. And how they do things, how they do business, how they uh, look, what fashions are being pushed at us, and what uh, ideologies are being pushed at us, and what gender roles are being pushed at us. Can somebody say amen? Amen. We fought against that because we knew it was of the world. But because we, somewhere along the way, began to make compromises, and begin to make, well, it may be, it's just the way things are now. And maybe I just need to get up with the times a little bit. I, uh, I read a scripture where the Bible talks about not, not serving wine to someone. Serving liquor to someone. What does that scripture say? When it's, when it's, when it's in the cup, what does it What does it say? It talks about it talks about yeah giving giving of that and so I said as long as my kids are in my house they will not they will not serve at a restaurant they won't serve alcohol to nobody was that extreme maybe but the the point being hey and oh I'm fixing to really really step in it now I'm gonna really step in it now. I've watched some of you ladies, y'all start wearing your leggings, your leggings get longer and your dresses get shorter. It's first step to pants. You gonna go to hell for it? Hey, I'm not I'm not casting judgment on nobody. I'm just saying. All, all I'm saying is is our discernment gets messed up. And the way our discernment gets messed up is because we start gently, little by little, accepting some of the world. It's it's creeping in on us. It's creeping in all the time. And, and, And our discernment's getting cloudy. And you don't know what you're looking at now. I'm not saying that a person's got to be perfect in every area. I'm just saying if you're going to take advice from somebody, pick out the godliest people, the people that love God the most, the people that are striving to please God the most, the people that seem to be judging themselves the most, the the people that have the heavenly view the most, and listen to those people. And turn off all this counsel from the internet. Because it makes you feel validated or whatever. When you're talking about life advice, you don't need to feel validated. You need truth. Amen. Amen. You need truth. That's what you need. And hopefully there's somebody that loves you enough to give it to you. And hopefully there's someone that loves you enough to give it to you in the best way they can possibly give it to you that it will be palatable. But if you can't find that, and you just find some jerk that's telling you the truth, choose the jerk over the one that tells you everything good and makes you feel good about yourself that tells you a lie. Amen? Because truth is better than a lie. The first thing you're going to have to do to know whether counsel is good or bad is discern the motive of the one giving it to you. Secondly, you're going to have to determine the mindset, the philosophy, the worldview of the one giving the advice. And lastly, you need to evaluate the qualifications of the one giving advice. Does this person who is giving me this advice, do they have credibility in the area in which they're giving the advice? I say this to young people. The worst thing you can do is make life decisions from your peer groups. I read this story, and this this is just mind-boggling. You you guys know this. In 2 Chronicles 10 and 6, this is Rehoboam. This is Solomon's son. The wisest man who ever lived outside of Jesus Christ. This is his boy. This is his boy. 
Solomon, the one who wrote in, in his time the poetry and, and the analogies and the word pictures that he painted and the observations he made about nature and applied principles to them was, was so revolutionary and so amazing that kings and queens from all over the world would come to just listen to him. This is that man. This is his son. His dad passed off and Rehoboam here is taking the kingship. And Rehoboam took counsel with the old men that had stood before Solomon his father while he yet lived, saying, What counsel give ye me to return an answer to this people? And they spake unto him, saying, If thou be kind to this people and please them and speak good words to them, they will be thy servants forever. But he forsook the counsel which the old men gave him. And took counsel of the young men that were brought up with him and stood before him. What did his peer group say? In verse 14, and they, and they answered them after the advice of the young men, saying, After my father made your yokes heavy, but I will add thereto. My father chastened you with whips, but I will chasten you with scorpions. That was bad advice. It split a kingdom. It caused much, much distress. Fighting, infighting, civil wars. It divided. You ladies, we used to preach against soap operas because women used to stay home while their men went to work and these soap operas would come on and they were just glorified adultery fest. And you sit there and watch that stuff and you get disenchanted and dissatisfied with your husband because he wasn't handsome like that guy on the screen and he didn't have all the money that that guy had and he didn't do everything right. And it was designed to make you unhappy. All in the guise of looking like it would produce so much happiness. We used to preach against men going to work and getting too friendly with the secretary because the secretary, she would put on her best behavior at the workplace and she was there just to serve her boss and it was an opportunity for marriages to be split up. And then it went to novels, and now it's the internet, and now it's dating apps and social media and all these things. And you might say, well, Brother Gary, you're really feeling it tonight. You're just hitting all the bases. <laughs> I told you at the beginning of this, my motive is I see a lack of discernment. I see people being sucked into things, and they don't even know how they got there. And then they wake up one day and say, how in the world did this happen to me? How did I let this happen in my life? And what the devil is the master of is trying to put the blame on someone else. It was their fault. It was their fault. It was their fault. It was their fault. All the while, we opened ourselves up to bad advice. So I'm telling you, there is safety in the multitude of counsel if it's good counsel. And I didn't want to spend all my time about this, but let me switch gears real quickly. Because I really wanted to leave this kind of on a positive note. I, I, I watched a video, a short little two-minute, three-minute video recently. I don't remember when, but recently. And I know this is a bad example, but it bears out a good truth. The, uh, the owner of the Wyndham, I think, in Las Vegas. Is the Wyndham a big motel in, in, in Las Vegas? I think it is. It's a big, 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 big hotel, I guess, in, in Las Vegas. And uh, this interviewer, this, this uh, reporter was interviewing, I don't know the man's name, but anyway, he was interviewing him. And he, and he said this, he said, do entrepreneurs have just a greater tolerance for risk and pressure or do they just 
not have the gene that they don't feel the pressure. And the man responded so wisely. He said to both. He said, I, I gave an interview. He said, I'll never forget Michael Jackson. I gave, I gave Michael Jackson a tour of our motel before, right before we opened it. And Michael Jackson asked me, he said, are you scared? And he said, I said, no, I'm not scared. And he said, you mean you're not scared? All this, all this money and you've invested and everything. And Do you not worry if it's going to succeed or not? He said, listen, Michael. He said, I, I, I rounded up $526 million. $526 million before I ever put a shovel in the ground. I had multiple, multiple, multiple planning meetings. I, I did study groups. I did all the things necessary before I ever broke ground. And so my fear was way back then. I'm not afraid now. Amen. And I thought, that's wisdom. Hey, young person, if you'd be wise, you'd look at every person you know that got divorced and you'd ask why. You'd do your research. You'd, you'd do your research. You, you, you'd, you'd look around. You'd read the Bible. You'd do your research. And I'm telling you, it's the most serious decision you'll ever make outside of giving your life to Christ is who you're going to marry. It'll make you or break you. But you don't have to enter into it with fear. Amen? If you get godly counsel... And you let your parents who's walked down the road and they're qualified to give you advice on things you don't know nothing about yet. And they have fought some battles and they have endured some things and they've learned some things and, and they're looking back and they can help you. You'd be wise to listen to that counsel. Not go to your friends and say, oh, he's, he's so handsome. He treats me so good. He buys me so much stuff. And somebody's looking and said. Let's wait a minute. Let's see. Are they angry? Do they have a work ethic? Do they love God? And somebody outside of yourself is looking in and they're seeing character traits. Amen? Let the fear be done. The beginning, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. But when it comes time to step into it, the fear should have been subsided by then. Amen? Amen. Because, because we know the councils, it, it's, the people giving it have pure motives. They're qualified to give it. And God has not given us a spirit of fear, but a power of love and a sound mind. Amen. And so we don't have to live our lives in fear. We don't have to live our lives, well, what if I make a mistake? What if I make a mistake? What if I make a mistake? I'm going to close with this. I told Bryce something the other day, and I don't claim to be a wise man, but I truly believe God gave me wisdom and insight when I told him this. I said, son, I'm going to give you a life hack that will change your life if you'll listen to me. Life's very simple. Find the smartest people, the most gifted people, the most knowledgeable people, the most charitable people that you can find and get as close to them as you can Amen. and ask their advice and weigh it and if it's good, take it. But understand this, and this is what I want to say to you tonight and I'm closing. Good people High value people will give free advice once. Listen to this. Listen to this. Mary and I went to a network marketing conference in Las Vegas several years ago. Eric Ward put this on. There were about 7,000 people there. There was not one company mentioned, there was not one product being sold. It was just simply on the principles of network marketing. And I have mentioned this lady before, but he brought this lady up. She looked homely. She didn't look successful. She didn't have the rich look. She was just very modest. 
And he began to tell of this lady's qualifications. Fortune 500 companies flew her all over the world to meet with their leadership teams, to speak to them on leadership. And she got up and she spoke for probably, I don't know, 45 minutes to an hour. I don't remember a lot about what she said, but Sister Anita, one thing she said that I remembered. She said, when I meet with someone, someone calls me and they request some of my time. She said, I always give them a half an hour. I don't charge a penny for it. I never ask for anything monetarily in return. She said, I always, I always give that person an assignment before we leave. If they meet their assignment, if they complete their assignment, they just bought more of my time. If they do not, I'm busy. I told Bryce, said you get with as good a people that you can possibly find. Ask their advice and take it. And then you work like a madman to develop your gifts, your talents, your interests, become the best that you can possibly be in every area so you will have something to contribute to the relationship. Because if you don't bring anything to the table, high value people will distance themselves from you. I'm giving you some life lessons right now. I don't care what field you're in or what you need in your life. There is enough good people around that will help you if you're willing to take advice and learn and contribute. And listen, brothers and sisters, as Christians, we have something to contribute. Every single person here has something to contribute. You may be in the, in the presence of people that are way, way, way above you in their economic monetary status. You don't have to feel intimidated in the least. You may be in, 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 the, in, the, con, in the conversation with someone that their education, they use words you can't even understand a tenth of them. You don't have to be intimidated at all to be in their presence. You might say, well, what, Brother Gary, what do I have to give? You have your character to give. Amen. You have your prayers to offer. You have your love to give freely. You have your genuine Christian faith to give. Amen. You can contribute enough to the elite of the elite in any area if you're just willing to give. Amen. Amen. This is incredible. This is, this, is what, this is where I wanted to get to in the message because, hey, there's enough good advice out there that you could sidestep so many troubles and heartaches in your life. You don't have to go down the road of heartaches and pain and trouble. If you could just learn and be willing to contribute and give, there is good people around that will spend time with you. They will mentor you. They will, they will come along beside you and they will counsel you and they will help you. They will, they will give to you. But you have to be willing to contribute. Stand if you would. I'm burdened because, Jaylen, I don't want to see you wind up like many others. And you don't have to. You don't. But if you sit there and you watch the internet, you talk to your friends and you take life advice from them, you will. You won't think you will because you think you're smarter than them. You've seen them, but you will. You don't have to, though. Amen. Eddie and Whitney, I don't want to see y'all go to the divorce courts. You don't have to. And nobody ever thinks they will. But you don't have to.